Hello everyone. Welcome back to our Lee County Library Science Club. It's great to have you with us once more. Uh, just a reminder, please make sure you have your parents' permission and some supervision when you're working with these experiments. Now this week, we are going to explore one of nature's coolest phenomena, which is known as a vortex. A vortex is defined as a fluid that is moving around a central axis line. Now, what, what does that even mean? What does that look like? Well, we would know a vortex as a whirlpool, or a tornado, or uh, an eddy in a river, something like that. Which means, when it says a fluid, a fluid just means something that's not solid, that can move, which is a pretty much any liquid or gas is a fluid. Now, as we've talked about in the past, fluids have certain properties like surface tension and cohesion that impact the way they move and how they are affected by what's around them. But when you have two fluids that are trying to move past each other or move around each other, whether they are made of the same substance or not, there can be a lot of conflict there. And this is where a vortex comes in. So a vortex, as we said, it looks like a whirlpool. Okay, It's moving around a central axis. And what that does is it creates momentum in two different directions. You've got momentum flowing horizontally okay, in the direction that the whirlpool is spinning, or the vortex is spinning. You've got that horizontal momentum. And then you also have that angular downward momentum towards the center of the vortex. And the fact that you have those moving in two different directions at the same time lets the two fluids move together and move past each other in a much easier way than they would be able to normally. One of the keys to why this works is that when you have a vortex formed, there is always an open pathway for the particles of each fluid to continue moving. There's never a time when they're going to be stuck and stopped. They're always able to move. And that's due to that specific kind of momentum and energy that is experienced inside a vortex. Now, I know I've just thrown a whole lot of words at you that might be a little bit hard to understand. So, we're going to do a little bit more demonstrating this time, which means I need to tell you how to create the experiment first. What you're going to need this week is two soda bottles. They can be two liter or one liter, but you want to make them big enough that you can get a good amount of water in there so you can really see what's happening. Okay? So we need two bottles. You need a metal washer that is roughly the width of the bottle top opening, but that also has a large enough central area to allow water to pass through. And then you just need some duct tape. Now as you can see, I took one bottle, filled it oh, about two-thirds of the way with water. I put that washer on top of the first bottle and then put the second bottle on top, made sure they were nice and tight together, and then wrapped it a few times with duct tape. Easy, right? No trouble. So, now that we've got our Vortex bottle built, we can do some demonstrating. Now first, I want to show you what happens when fluids try to move past each other without a Vortex being around. Now you've probably seen this happen, like when you've tried to dump out a jug into the sink or something. You have these, the air is one fluid in the bottom, you have the water in the, as a fluid on top, they're trying to move past each other. But because of the surface tension of the water, the air has to come through in those little short bursts of bubbles. There's no real clear pathway for them to move past each other. Now this is taking a long time. It's causing a lot of turbulence, um, a lot of commotion. You can hear it making those glug, glug, glug sounds. 
Okay, so it's just a really inefficient way for these fluids to move past each other. If that type of fluid motion were to happen in a natural setting, like say in a river, if you have the two flows flowing past each other and they try to push through each other and take turns the way the water and the air were doing there, well you'd have a really, really rough, rough river, wouldn't you? But what actually happens in, the, in those cases, they start to have a circular flow, and you see what it creates there? You can see that kind of vortex. It's like a whirlpool. I'll show that again. Now you see how much more smoothly everything is moving? It's quiet, it's efficient, it's fast. And all the water gets there much more quickly, doesn't it? Now as I said, in the cases of a river or another place that whirlpools form are tidal straits where you have tides coming in and out um, between islands or something. And in these cases, they create a whirlpool because it's the most efficient way for the water to get from one side to the other when it can't just push past the land that's in the way. Now another thing I want you to notice about this, which is pretty cool, is as we've talked about, a vortex has kind of its own special kind of momentum, right? That, that horizontal and angular momentum that's going on. And the cool thing is, it does not take very much outside force to get that momentum started and once it does it actually perpetuates itself until all the fluid has moved. So the first couple times I did this I gave it a really good shake to get the water flowing but it doesn't take that much and if you watch closely I can get it started with just one little shake and it took it a second to get there, but you saw all by itself, it changed from having those bubbles going to turning into that nice, smooth, consistent vortex. Now the next part of this I want to show you is actually what's happening on the bottom part of the vortex. It's really cool because it demonstrates what that momentum actually looks like. So on top, we have all the water around the outside, right? And the air flowing through the middle. The air is going up through the middle and the water is flowing down around the outside. Now I want you to watch what's happening in this bottom bottle at the same time. It may be a little bit hard to see, but the water is not falling in a drop down the middle of the bottle. Okay, It's not falling straight down. The water is swirling around the outside of the bottle. You see that? You can see it coming around the outside of the bottle. And that's because, as we said, the momentum in the top is creating an angle this way, from the top and through. And so it continues that momentum and it runs along the outside of the bottle on the bottom. Now we've talked about how we see vortexes in water, right? Um, when you have rivers coming together and that water has to join together and keep flowing, or when you have water flowing um, from the ocean into a tidal area through some tidal strait, okay, where there's land in the way and the ocean has to squeeze through that land to get back into the next area. Because there's so much fluid trying to move through a small area, it creates that vortex to get through. But we also see this in the air and the clouds when we have tornadoes. So what's happening with the clouds in a tornado? This vortex that we see in a tornado, this actually would start horizontal in the air because we have wind flowing from one direction and wind blowing from the other direction. And rather than just running into each other and creating a big jumble, one pushes down, the other one pushes up, and because they start this, they start to flow 
around each other in that vortex shape. And so you've got this vortex going on up in the clouds that then, due to other wind factors, this actually gets tipped sideways. And then we have the tornado. And of course, this is the scary thing that we all see on TV when they say there's a tornado around, right? But again, the vortex is actually a very important phenomenon that occurs in nature that allows um, these fluids, whether it's air or water, that allows them to move throughout the world with actually causing less disturbance and less problems than they would if they weren't able to move past each other in such an efficient form. Now one thing I mentioned earlier, as I said, it always has an open particle path for each type of fluid. And you'll see in this vortex, there's always a path open around the outside for the water, and there's always a path open around the inside for the air. And that's going to be true of any vortex that's happening. If you have two bodies of water meeting, okay, if they're just running into each other, sometimes, as we see here, if I don't make the vortex, okay, there's not always an open path, right? Because we have the water drops, and then it stops to let the air up. And in the other way, the air is stuck here until the water drops past it and some air releases in these bubbles. It's just not consistent. It's not steady. But in the vortex, there's always an open path for each fluid to be moving. Now when you try this at home, try it with putting different amounts of force on the spin. Maybe try doing it in different directions. Okay, are you able to do it better one direction or the other? How much force does it actually take to get the momentum going to be able to create that? Um, another cool thing you can do is maybe get a stopwatch and time how long it takes for the water to drain from the top to the bottom. Okay, and see like if you start the spin harder and make it go faster, does that actually mean that the water drains out faster? Or is it just spinning faster? These are some cool things that you can look at and help you understand the way that water and other fluids move. Thank you so much for watching. We're so glad to have you and we hope you come back next time. Bye!